Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And today on the show, I have for the second time someone from Leader Games. I have the one, the only, Cole Worley on the show. Welcome to the show, Cole. Thanks for having me, Jack. Yeah, this is going to be really cool because one of the things that really is distinctive about you just in audio form is how deep your voice is. And I frequently get told how deep my voice is. So this is going to be like Tom Waits duetting with Leonard Cohen or something. This is this is going deep and dark. Right. We talk quiet enough. People can get their ASMR. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. And who knows what people are going to be using this audio for later on down the road. But I think it's fitting considering that you have an upcoming expansion for Root coming out and it's all about going deep and dark. So why don't we just kind of set the table with the the what is Root the Underworld? So on March 14th, we're launching the new Root Kickstarter and it will feature two new factions as well as a lake and map, uh, a lake map and a mountain map. Um, the boards will be like the winter board and that they'll have variable clearings. So they have their own kind of special rules. Uh, and as well, we've got tons of other goodies that we're launching with the Kickstarter too, uh, including a completely alternate deck, which like really mixes up all the different design options. Um, it's it's just going to be a lot of content to, to uh, toss over to folks. This is going to be a little bit of a different Kickstarter for us. Uh, so we launch on March 14th, and it's going to be a short Kickstarter, just two weeks. We don't have any stretch goals. The main question for the Kickstarter is... Um, we're trying to gauge interest in uh, what will become the fourth printing for Root. And in order to do that, we thought, okay, we're going to take it back to Kickstarter. We want to make sure that we can kind of bring back in our old base for some of the new stuff we've been working on. Um, but we you know, we don't kind of plan like a long lingering Kickstarter. So we don't really have any surprises up our sleeves. Like we're going to be able to show folks a lot of stuff and hopefully take care of the backers who have kept us in business. You know, I am blown away by the idea that you thought the game was going to be complete, like the river folk was going to flush it out. And that was all you really needed to do to to make it the, the game as originally envisioned. And it didn't need any additional support beyond that. I mean, of course, you know, you want a finished product to be stable and 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 meet the needs of a good game. But also, I got to imagine that as you were developing the game, there were just constantly new ideas of different factions and races that you wanted to implement and ultimately got on the cutting room floor. Well, this is a strange thing about the development of the design. So like as we were going through the Kickstarter, Patrick had given me this kind of concept. Uh, with these sort of four different positions that I've been working from. And then as the, and we thought the Kickstarter would be kind of like a modest hit, uh, but it, it way over exceeded our expectations. And Patrick said, okay, you need to start thinking about the next level of content. So Patrick and I had a few kind of brainstorm sessions. You know, we got coffee and just sort of hashed it out and sort of came up with the concepts for the, for the river folk and for the cult. And at that point, like, even though I wanted to make the system capacious and flexible, like that was kind of how, I mean, I, I don't come from a design tradition which has sort of like endless expansions. Usually when I, when I've worked on a game, like I try to make it as big and as closed as I can, as I can make it. And so we worked on it and we worked on it and, you know, we're, we're, a, we're we, we operate on the studio model, which means everyone at Leader is more or less um, salaried with a couple of exceptions, and we all kind of get together and just work and work and work on each project. And we played the game hundreds and hundreds of times in the studio, and by the end of it, I think we all felt like it was done. But there were these little hints, these like little, like there were, there'd be times we'd have playtesters over and they would ask to borrow the copy which is a rare thing. Usually playtesters come, you feed them pizza, they play some games, and then they go their merry way. But there were just these instances where they were like, ah, can we, can we maybe take that back with us? We'll bring it back tomorrow. And so we'd say, sure. Um, and, and so there were just th these little senses that there was something about the game that was really animating people. And then what really sort of changed our thinking um, was that when, when the fall began... Uh, so the, the game was released in, in late summer. Uh, we, we shipped it right before Gen Con, so like at the end of July. And it had hardly been in people's hands for like two or three weeks when we started seeing fan factions get posted on BoardGameGeek. And at this point, 
I was, uh, Patrick had handed off Vast the Mysterious Manor to myself and to our other uh, office developer, uh, Nick Brockman, and we were working a lot on the new Vast game. It was taking up all my time. We were kind of rebuilding certain parts and polishing other parts. And there's just this drip. It was like every day there was a new faction. In fact, there was one day that like three different factions got posted to BGG. Uh, and Patrick was kind of in between projects. And so he, you know, he came over to my desk one day and said, Hey, um, I know I don't want to like get ahead of you because you're doing TMM right now, but would it be okay if I just did kind of like a fan faction? Like it's not an official expansion. We're not announcing anything. I just kind of want to like go play in the root space a little bit. Uh, and I said, oh, you know, of course. I mean, I I built the game for him and for the company, so it was it was I was like kind of I was really honored that he would like ask me that. But you know, of course. So he said, actually he was working on I think the lake and the mountain map might have been first, but pretty soon he had a couple of expa- factions going, and he just kept working on them, and they kept kind of getting more interesting and better. And you know, most of our days were kind of taken with vast testing, but then every once in a while, Patrick would say, "Okay, I want you guys to try out." you know, kind of how I'm imagining these factions to work. And all the while, I mean, there's like this critical mass, this big community, people are having like root days and they're, I mean, we're getting inundated with other factions and people like the one question everybody's asking us, our support email is just filled with it. Like folks wanting to know like, when's the next Kickstarter? They kept missing out on it. And for a small company, like we can't print enough to make everybody happy at the same time. So like the size of the first Uh, print run was like the most that we could possibly print Uh, our warehouse is just not that big Uh, and we only had so much capital for it and they were gone like instantly and we did a second run which which arrived kind of in late november or early december and they were also gone instantly and so increasingly it was uh, it it became clear that like okay if we want to do like another big run and uh, like it makes sense to go back to Kickstarter. And Patrick has been working on this expansion that's really grown into kind of like its own, you know, it, it was offering something so unique and, and compelling. I mean, I find it, I've spent a lot of time in Root, and I really liked Patrick's factions because they were so in keeping with the spirit of the game. Um, but they were very fresh. What do you consider the spirit of the game? Like, what, as opposed to someone else designing expansion content, or you know, someone else coming in and pitching you ideas, what what is the spirit of the game that endears you to new material that Patrick was working on? Yeah. So, so Rue is, I think, fundamentally kind of an old fashioned game. It's asymmetry is is I, I think the kind of useful hook but like at its core like this is a multilateral conflict game uh in the way that a lot of games were like in the 1980s these are games where like your friends are going to put pieces on the table and you are going to remove those pieces and the removal is not always counterbalanced with like a catch-up mechanism or like a clever scoring thing that's going to put everybody on the same uh, stage and so the thing that is interesting then about the game is not is not that uh, it's about kind of turn-to-turn optimization, but all the players and the way they're kind of putting pressure on each other are generating this narrative about what happened in the game. And that narrative is so much bigger than, like, who ends up winning at the end. I mean, this is, you know, this is sort of like a classic thing that, like, winning is very, very important. It is essentially the goal that puts all the players on the same page. I mean, I I often think about it like a, a script, you know, when you're playing a game, everyone's kind of acting, and the victory condition is is the script. And if everybody, in order to be acting out the play, everybody needs to have the same script. But who actually ends up winning in the end isn't is often like the most least interesting part of the game. Uh, it's about those like pressures. And so one of the things that we saw as people were designing factions, it was it was interesting because the factions that people would design reflected what they were getting from root. And people were obviously getting really different things. I mean, some of the factions that we saw, and I, I, we kind of made it a point to sort of like print them out and read all of them as they as they came out. I think there's something like 40 or 50 of them by this point. <laughs> but I, I mean, which is insane. It's insane. But one of the things uh, that we would find a lot is the factions were sort of like Euro optimization puzzles, which is like, fine. I mean, there's a whole good genre built around those things. Um, but for me, the way that 
like I never thought about Root from one like as a single fa- faction. When I was working in design, I was trying to always keep in mind that like the correct the correct vantage point to work on this design is not about the individual faction. It's about the system and about the web of interaction. And what Patrick did in his factions is he kind of like touched in on that and tried to think about the spaces where he thought the players could be interacting with each other and then build around there as opposed to thinking like, oh, Root doesn't have a deck building faction, so I'll build a deck building faction. Totally, totally. You know, when I reviewed the game and, and I spent so much time playing it, I played solo, I played at each of the different player accounts, and the conclusion that I ultimately came to is that it's such a, a beautifully elegant and simple framework from like a, a purely once your pieces are on the board standpoint. You know, like your your pieces typically move similar to other pieces, combat is consistent. It's the the layers of interaction. Uh, and almost like components that are being added and removed that create the complexity of the game. You know, the learning one individual faction isn't too tough. And I, I've seen a lot of discussion online about whether it's a really complex game, whether it's a simple game, whether it's too hard to teach for the level of complexity once you've learned it. What, what I think the beauty about it is that that sandbox, you're getting to play and experiment and see how these layers interact with one another and affect one another. So, you know, that's what the river folk really did for me is it allowed new components in the four player game to be swapped out that would make for dramatically different stories and arcs of the game, new considerations to make that are still fundamentally within this very, very narrow infrastructure once you're actually in the middle of playing it. Yeah, and and I'll say too, like one of the biggest... So I I have a weird position with respect to the expansion. So I'm I'm designing the supplementary deck, and then uh, Nick Brockman is handling the primary development. Patrick did the original design, and then I am like a kind of drop-in developer and sort of like a creative director of the project, which is a great role reversal because usually I have to pitch ideas to Patrick and then Patrick will tell me no. <laughs> and now it's the, now the shoes on the other foot. Um, <laughs> and it, it's been really fun. It's also been fun because uh, Nick who worked with me on TMM is a really, has grown into a really fantastic, become a real fantastic developer. And one of the nice things about working in this studio is like our desks are right next to each other. Um, if something isn't working, you know, Nick might pull me in and we'll play three or four games just in a single sitting and just quick, like we'll either do two handed or just a two player game and we'll kind of iterate and I, I can drop down and then get very specific and very nitpicky. And I did all the graphic design for root as well. And I will also like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them things like, Oh, I, I think, you know, this paragraph's too wide or whatever. Um, and so I can be very, very, very detail oriented. But then, because ultimately he's sail- sailing the ship now, I can just pull right out and, and let him go his own way. And because all of us are really interested in just making something that's going to be really good. Uh, because I think everyone at the studio has a natural aversion to expansions in general. Um, just you always, They always threaten the, the core. Mm-hmm. And so we want to make sure that... Um, this one pushes the game forward, um, and, and and that kind of it's a healthy skepticism. But when it comes to your, your point about uh, the expansion mixing up the different dynamics, this is my favorite thing about the fact that we have six factions because I love like playing without the bur- without the eerie and swapping in like having like the lizards and the Woodland alliance or even two vagabonds and the cat, like those weird three player games is, that's my, those are my jam. I love the weird three player games, uh, games without the cats, I think are fabulous. Um, you have to pick the right faction mix to get it to work. Um, but one of the big priorities in developing this expansion is in the moles, uh, the great underground duchy, uh, is to give the cats a real good competitor for that kind of like policeman of the woods role. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we've been testing on the office is, really working on the two-player game and making sure the cats versus the moles is hard and interesting. Um, and, and, and so far, it's gone pretty well. But also just playing a lot of games without the cats. Because when you remove that ballast from the ship, uh, 
it allows it to move in really fun and and kind of new ways. And I think for that reason alone, the expansion is going to just completely multiply the top the possible player configurations. One of the things about the game that I, I think is so interesting is that it is at its core focused as a four player game. And in truth, I don't always have four people to play a game with, or rather three other people to play a game with. And I really dig the for lack of a better term, instability of Root, the little bit of jank that comes in and that sort of self-policing that players at the table have to do in order to accommodate lower player counts where, you know, the, the factions by design aren't necessarily balancing each other out. And so the players have to get creative in how they approach a game. And I'm wondering if, especially at like two-player or even solo, if this new expansion has given any thought to how to stabilize the game a little bit more. So I think our priority is on the three to five player game. There is a bit of a split in the office about the ideal count for root. I'm firmly in the count that I think the game is best of three. Um, but I, th there is something to the four player game. And then I tend not to like it at five or six, but Patrick actually prefers it as a five player game. And there, like, there are questions of downtime. I think there, are, for me, player count. And this is something I've said before, but it, you know, I have to remind myself of it. Um, games of smaller player count, uh, there's a wider range of possible strategies. With more players sitting at the table in interactive design, usually there's a bigger crowd that can control the more um, the more aberrant strategies. Um, so like you, you just can't get away from it. You, you can't get away with, with, with more wild things. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to preserve, uh, and this is a place where root is quite different than vast. Um, vast, when you play it different fact, uh, with different player configurations, the game still feels pretty much the same because certain rules activate. Like if you don't have the cave in a game, somebody gets like the cave card and they, they kind of do that role with root. The game is just different. It's really different. And one of the examples that always comes to mind when I'm thinking through this are uh, the power of the Eerie. The Eerie are kind of, uh, right now, they're probably one of the weaker factions in the game. Um, but if you play in a game without the cats, the Eerie will be the strongest faction on the board. Um, just no one can kind of cover ground the way they can if they're not getting opposed. And there are ways that they can play that are really, that will really tilt things. And so... You know, I, I I find that for some groups, the different configurations then are very disruptive to their understanding, and they might find that that d d disruption pleasurable or not, right? Uh, but with, with this expansion, you know, we wanted to offer with the moles a faction that could kind of replace the cats or or be played against them, um, and then the crows are a little more in the spirit of the woodland alliance. If um, if we had to give each faction like kind of an archetype. Um, but we are trying as explicitly as possible to make it so that there are the maximum number of player configurations. In fact, uh, just today in the office, they played a game that I think was like Cats, Moles, and Crows, and the Woodland Alliance. So both of the like twin roles were all in the same game, uh, and, and it worked great. It was probably the best game out of our out of our recent tests. That's great to hear. And, and, you know, you were talking about the community developing things. One thing that I, I have to mention is how fervent the solo community is, not just for Root, but, you know, in tabletop gaming, the solo community is so innovative in creating these different solo variants for, for all kinds of different games. But you have a, a solo mode with the mechanical marquee in Root. And while I really dig the the ambition of creating that and having a full separate player mat, in, in reality, it doesn't make for a very satisfying game. But the community has been going crazy with coming up with all of these different solo modes. And probably the best thing that I could see is that there have been solo modes developed for playing against any sort of faction. Because sometimes if you're playing on your own, you want to be the cats. You don't want to have them excluded from the possibility of ever playing them. And do you think that there's ever going to be any sort of official codification of some of these deeper, more heavily developed solo modes? In terms of the mechanical marquee, um, that was the first. That was my first attempt at a solo design. I had 
we, you know, it, it's funny. In the Kickstarter, there was a big outcry for it. And so we said, okay, at a certain funding goal, uh, it can pay for like three to four weeks of my time, which means that we, we can direct kind of development resources towards it. Um, and so when that happened, I thought, okay, well, it's successful enough that I'm going to be develop, you know, designing a solo mode for this. And it was a tricky, I mean, it was probably one of the hardest elements of the game to get to work because it had to do a lot of different things. Some people wanted a cooperative mode they kind of play against. Other people just wanted like kind of a dummy player to fill out player counts. Uh, some people wanted like weird combinations of those things. And I am not a solo gamer. Like I am... Um, gaming for me is a really social activity. And I, it's, it's been, you know, I grew up playing JRPGs and sort of old solo PC games. But I haven't played a solo PC game in years. Um, and a lot of my, my friends, though, are solo gamers. And so I just, you know, I kind of gave myself a little bit of a crash course. But even the really f- good solo designs, I had a, they had a hard time gripping me. So I, w- I felt a little bit like when I was working on the Mechanical Marquee that I was working a little bit in the dark. Because it was difficult for me to tell what was making it good and what was making it, like, too random. That line b- between tells a really good surprising story and like is too arbitrary and random i found it very hard to get like a good read on that um but we got it to a point where it worked and that people could beat it and so we thought okay we're gonna we're just gonna go ahead and (laughs) go with this it works fine um and it kind of stuck in the back of my, my brain a little bit and it was interesting because when um when we when my brother and i were doing the pax premier kickstarter there was a big, uh, a big contingent of people who wanted us to do a, a, a bot for Pax Premier, and in that instance, I said, you know, I would rather, for, I would rather contract this out. And so, a guy named uh, Ricky Royal, no, well, that's, I think that's like his username. His actual name is R- 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 Richard Wilkins. He's a, he's a Brit. Um, he built a wonderful bot, and I found it was interesting in the as we were finishing Premier and developing it. Uh, he he gave us his bot. He gave my brother and I the bot he had built called Wakan, and I loved. I had a wonderful time developing that bot, working on someone else's work. Um, I just it was great to kind of like think about. I love thinking about rules, um, and I think uh, this is most clearly illustrated by the way the law of root works. I love thinking about games and the rules of games in terms of like structure and hierarchy, a little bit like programming. And it was so much fun to take this big sprawling bot uh, that Ricky had built and turn it into something that I found a little more elegant. And when I was done, I felt like, okay, I think I have a good sense of what makes a solo game tick. I don't know if I ever want to design one, but I, I got a good sense of it. Now, this is obviously like happening this fall, three months after <laughs> the release of Root. Um, and as we watch people play, uh, you know, I, I try to read every single comment that I can find about Root, uh, the good, the bad, everything in between. I just want I want to get better at my craft. Um, and so I paid a lot of attention to people playing the solo design. And as we were thinking about what we wanted to include in this Kickstarter, uh, fleshing out the, the solo game was, cons- was pretty high on our list. Uh, and around this time, uh, one of our staff contacted, uh, and I've, I've forgotten uh, this person's name, but the person who designed the Better Pro- Bot Project. Oh, yeah. Um, and we were playing them and kind of studying them and in the office, and we're really impressed by the depth of the work. And so there is a plan with this Kickstarter as an add-on. Um, we have come to an agreement where we're going to take those in for some in-house development, um, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to guarantee that every single one of the bots in the Better Bot Project that will make it uh, into a little like uh, expansion, a kind of micro expansion. But the majority of them will, and uh, and people will be able to kind of purchase a professionally printed and organized rules for those bots. So we won't be folding them into like the main line of products, just because those bots are complicated, and it would be. It would be a little overwhelming, I think, um, to sort of have someone get into root and there's a lot going on, and then to also find like this pretty heady 
automated opponent, but we will off, be offering those in the future, and th- that will begin with the Kickstarter campaign. That is fantastic news, and I think that's a BGG user Benjamin is just what it's listed as in common. I think is uh, the username there, but uh, fantastic work, and I'm glad that you've reached out to them to kind of codify some of this stuff because I, I think the the need is there and. You know, what's cool about solo games, because like you, I I grew up playing a lot of JRPGs, a lot of single player games, but board gaming was purely a a community thing. It was a way of interacting with friends. It was dependent upon the human opponent. But as the last couple of years have gone by, I have found myself more interested in just what sorts of solo variants there are out there. And I found that the ones that I like the best are not the ones that are purely uh, acting as another player at the table and you're essentially playing for them, but the ones that sort of interpret what is the impact of another player at the table, but then using that in a sort of elegant system. And I think the, the, the notion was there with the mechanical marquee. And that's what I appreciate so much about it. Even if the execution wasn't uh, the, the ultimate realization of what that could be, but yeah, I, I dig it. I'm looking, that's, that's the best news that I could hear in this podcast. Honestly, Cole, oh, good. you've made my evening, but I can't talk about root purely. Well, I could talk about root purely, but there are a couple things that I want to hit on here uh, because, you know, from the beginning, I probably should have focused on who are you to leader games. You know, some people know you as the root dude. A lot of people know you as the Pax Pamir dude, but you are officially part of leader games. What is your role? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm the staff designer. Um, we don't really like it's a small enough company that uh, we can kind of all have whatever title <laughs> we want. My business card just says game design and development. Um, I don't give myself a rank. Um, my relationship with Patrick is interesting. Um, I did not, you know, there are some people to their credit who work very hard to get into the game industry and. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate that I found a good position that that supports me. I mean, this is my my full-time gig, and it supports my wife and children. Um, But uh, it it was it it wasn't something I necessarily was looking for. I mean, game design for me was always something I was sort of doing on my own time, uh, and just kind of gently gently prodding. And I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean, I can I can kind of go back to the beginning about how my relationship with Patrick started, if you'd like. Yeah, I'd love that because when I first talked with Patrick, that was like the first big break interview that I had way back in the day. I was like, oh, Patrick Leader is coming on to my podcast. I've only done three of these. Um, I, I wasn't even intending for it to be an interview podcast at that time. It was, I think, the first reprint of Vast it was up on Kickstarter. It was still during the campaign. And then I know that there were some, uh, I guess, developments going on with Deep was the announced next game. And at some point along there, I know you came in and I'd love to hear the story of how you got inserted into the fold and also where Root, which is to me the the thing that really put uh leader games on the map even more so than than vast ever did at the time what was the the timeline in creation of that the gen con that vast was released was a strange gen con um i can't i think it would have been 2016 maybe it was 2015 um but uh, i was at that gen con Uh, i grew up in and around indiana and would oftentimes make it back to gen con and you know there's always like the the game that's the the talk of the con and that year it was vast and i went got i didn't even have time to get a demo i just snagged a copy but just talking to everybody at that booth they were just so passionate i mean they had made something cool and the game had the cool the best hook beautiful beautiful art and so i picked it up and I played it, and uh, and I liked it, and it was it was interesting and ambitious, and not, it just was not the kind of game that this industry has been producing, uh, and so I found it very, very compelling. And I went I went back to Austin. I was finishing um, I was finishing my PhD and kind of wondering what I wanted to do in my career. I was up for a couple postdocs, 
Um, and I just sort of assumed that I'd be teaching. And then uh, I I had a, a short correspondence with Patrick, just telling him that I really admired the game. Um, I've been doing some design, but he did, Patrick, had, I don't think even today he hasn't played a lot of my earlier games. Uh, basically, the way I practice design is that um, if I was running into a history problem that I didn't really understand, I would build little games around it. And sometimes I would have, like, graduate school is very busy, but then also you have these, like, weird pockets of time where you might have two months where you're teaching, but you're not, like... You're sort of meant to wander a little bit uh, in terms of what you're thinking about. And so I would work on designs. Um, and I was in a rhythm with uh, Phil Eklund, who was kind of like my mentor uh, in the industry, where I kind of would give him something, and then he would like it and kind of help me through development. And then I would finish it at the same time as the school year finished in May, and then it'd come out the following Essen. So we did that with PAX, and then we did that with the PAX expansion. Uh, I did a similar thing with a game called the Inf An Infamous Traffic, and I had I had kind of stumbled into this kind of small community of gamers that were adjacent to Phil Eklund's primary crowd. Uh, Phil Eklund is the somewhat controversial, but he's a uh, former rocket scientist who makes really wonky science games. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's I think the best way to describe him. He's he's a very kind, wonderful man, um, and and he was he was he's been very very always very helpful for me, even if I bicker about him with politics constantly. Um, but you know, he he had this really dedicated following um, that he had built over about twenty years. I think he saw in me someone who thought a little bit the same way about in term, about games, where he wanted games that had arguments that were trying to, to tell people things. And so, you know, a game about 1820s Afghanistan isn't really primed to sell any copies. But Phil has a little audience of a few thousand people, and any game that I published with Phil would be sold out in a month. Uh, we did small runs, but it was for that audience. So, you know, I've been doing the, these games um, purely because I loved – this audience, I loved the process of researching a game and then developing it, and I had kind of built slowly a stable of playtesters. Um, because so playtesters, uh, when you're working with them, they have very high attrition rates. Uh, it's really easy to wear them out. Um, and I had found over the course of a few development cycles a really good core group of about six different groups, and just loved talking about games with them. And so it, it was. It felt very much like when I'd have a game, I would start a new like Telegram chat thread, and then everybody would hop in, and we would just argue about it and and kind of hash it out. But they were they were something about what I was doing was compelling, um, and I was also enjoying the process of seeing the game through. And then a couple things happened. Um, one thing that happened is uh, I got to meet Patrick uh, briefly at South by Southwest uh, 2017, which was the last year I was in Austin. And um, I'd been interested in Deep and uh, because you know it was the new game from Leader Games. And so I went and played it and had a, a kind of like – I had a mixed, a mixed impression of it. I mean it's a game in development, so it, it's hard to judge. Um, and I went and talked to Patrick and, and, and kind of gave him a little bit of my thoughts, but then that was pretty much it. Uh, and I kind of stayed, you know, stayed on the sidelines. And then uh, that summer, I turned in my dissertation, and right as I had submitted it, I was kind of filled with nervous energy, and it was maybe three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And I saw on Twitter that Patrick had a job opening for a developer. And I was just sitting at my desk, not doing anything, and kind of wanting to work. And so I dashed off a cover letter and sent my resume to him. And I really had just had no idea. I was like, well, I'm up for like a couple other jobs elsewhere, but you know, if a job, like if I wanted to work anywhere, it would be for a small company with an audience that I, so like there are all these boxes being ticked, right? Like I like Patrick personally. Uh, I loved working at small companies. Um, I liked the idea that he had like a really strong brand. And I also, and this is, um, a little mercenary of me, but I mean, I, I told Patrick as much. I really liked an audience, like his audience I loved, and I didn't have any access to them. Um, people who played Vast didn't play the stuff that I played, norm like normally. And so the idea of like, oh, I get to work and get contact with this new audience, 
and with people that I like and with a brand that I think is really strong and could do something. These, this, these seem like very good reasons that we should be working together. Totally. Um, what's, what's your doctorate in? Uh, so I was uh, – my doctorate's in, the Engli- in English. I studied um, 19th century British Empire, uh, novels around the empire, and how people imagine distances of time and space. Oh, lofty stuff. Um, well, it's, it was a living. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know a lot about submarine telegraph cables. So if you, if you want to talk about gutta percha, we can, we can get real into, real into it. Um, I, you know, it's funny. Graduate school, um, it embitters a lot of people. It's hard. Um, and it, it, it's a bit of a trip, but for some, and I'm one of the lucky folks in this regard, uh, it was, it was fun. I loved it. Um, I was happy it was done because it was a lot of work, but I would have been very happy kind of like staying in the Academy. I wasn't like, I wasn't looking to, I wasn't looking to jump ship, which gave, you know, so I wrote Patrick on that Friday and then he emailed me that night at like 1am. (laughs) <laughs> or something like that. And he had um, questions about designs they were working on and some other things. And, you know, from my perspective, like I wasn't even really sure if I wanted this job. And Patrick wasn't really sure if he wanted a developer. And so we just sort of talked. And it was a really weird courtship because I feel like we took turns courting each other. <laughs> um, and, and, we, we, and, and really what happened is we just kind of established like a really long and slow r- 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 uh, long and slow r- 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 rapport where, you know, every day I would send him a note. And, you know, not every day, you know, he, he, would, he would have a question I'd send him about. And sometimes the questions were about a really specific design thing. Uh, And other times the questions were about kind of more business stuff and factory stuff like, oh, did I have experience copy editing? We talk about that Uh, because, you know, Patrick liked my resume and he really liked High Frontier, which is Phil's game about um, uh, the exploration of the solar system. And I'd worked a little bit on High Frontier, uh, just a little bit on an earlier edition on um, and 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 I had and I loved High Frontier. But the fact that I was like uh, adjacent to Phil really helped me. And so, but Patrick hadn't played any of my games. Um, but it, it, you know, we, we just found that we really liked talking to, to each other. And so, you know, at that time they were working on deep and they were running, kind of running into a, a whole host of like little problems. Um, the core issue was that, um, the games designer and the folks working at the studio, uh, just they had different priorities, I think, about where they wanted the game to go. Um, and Patrick was increasingly kind of mired in business work and kind of needed an intermediary. Um, and so originally I started kind of as a contractor and I just, you know, I, I had time that summer because I was just finishing up my defense and for anybody who's ever gone through graduate school, you know that like you defend, but then you have this like weird, like four weeks of like revisions and there's just the end of graduate school, like it lingers. Um, and so, <laughs> and so I, I'm like going through this like lingering process where I, I don't have enough free time to like go on the job market properly. Um, and I don't want to like pick up like a random teaching gig, but Hey, I've got this contract work kind of helping with development. Um, and uh, development w- was interesting. We, we, we pushed on it, we pushed on it. And at one point, uh, I, I told Patrick, like, you know, um, for what you want to do, you're at, you actually want a different game. Um, and I think that, like, Deep can make it, but it's just going to take a lot of work. Uh, and, and, and I'm like, look, I'm happy to do that, but I think there might be, like, a totally different direction that you can go in. And uh, I built Patrick like a little proof of concept. And I was like, this is a weird little, like if I had to build an asymmetric strategy game from scratch, here's how it'd look. If I were to, this is Yeah, no, no, no. Well, yeah. And it was, it, and it was funny because we were having this conversation. I, I wasn't, it was interesting because Deep had interesting things going on in it. Um, but it, it just like, it had all these like structural, like what I perceived to be kind of structural problems. Again, things that were eminently fixable. And for folks that work in the industry, Games change a lot, and you just have to put a lot of work into them. And Patrick looked at a little proof of concept, and it was it, it, it was like themeless. It was just a proof of concept. And he was like, you know, this is really cool. Um, he's like, and he was like, you know, when I gave Sam the concept for Deep, I wanted, I imagined like a whole series of really interesting um, 
kind of asymmetric strategy games. And he's like, if we do that series, you should keep working on this little thing. And maybe Deep does well. Maybe we'll do another little strategy game. And the, like it could kind of fit in our wheelhouse in the same way that like the vast games are kind of linked. And we're working on other other asymmetric games that have like a similar kind of ethos. And so I said, okay, that's that that's fine. I'll work on this in my spare time. And I, I really just like kind of shelved it. And I went back and was like really, really working on deep. And then as we really got into it, um, there were just breakdowns of com- communication and it, 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 it took, there wasn't, it wasn't really a breakdown of communication. It was a, they were just shifting priorities. And we were, I was really trying to get to work because it was always like, it could almost fit in. And then, we had a, you know, we, we went to Gen Con and we thought like, okay, like everybody on the deep team was like, think like, okay, the, the game, basically the person who's designed the game said, I think it's going to be ready at Gen Con. And we said, okay, cool. Gen Con's like final submission. And I got reports from the playtest sessions and it just like wasn't quite firing right. And, you know, when you're a small publisher, you just can't take a risk. Yeah, totally. I mean, that, that that makes absolute sense to me. And I mean, everything's out there. It kind of it kind of broke bad and in a, a very public way. Uh, and I know that we even had Sam on the podcast here and I tried to reach out and actually got a statement from you guys uh, at, at the time because I, I felt bad only getting one side of the story there. But it, it totally makes sense to me as someone, you know, I've never designed a board game and I've never run a board game publisher, but I, I've been in management for most of my life. I've been in charge of creative projects. I know when you have to kind of pull the plug on something, even if you continue to invest, 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 and then ultimately someone's put what they think is is the final product on the table and you got to go, sorry, you know, like I have to go a different direction than this. As much as you are invested in this right now, um, I, I can't take that risk. I, I don't have the capital to do so. Uh, and I have my company to think about and the employees, the the people around me who are working on all sorts of projects. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was tough. And it was like, you know, I think one thing that didn't get, you know, it, it's so hard because like later – uh, when Sam kind of came out about it, it um, I made some we made some kind of initial statements, but we one of the things that we we didn't really want to get into at the time because every it was so hot, all the emotions were so hot, is that like <laughs> like everybody worked really hard on that game, like we wanted it so badly to work, um, you know, like we liked that that space to think in, uh, and and it was. In the way that when you're working in a studio, everybody is sort of contributing a lot. Like there were a lot of cool systems that, like, oh, they're almost firing, uh, and it, it was a, it was a bummer when it was clear that it just like wasn't gonna work. Um, so I'm newly hired. Um, we have a project that we don't know exactly what the way is, and then and Patrick kind of he looks at me and says, "Hey, that other asymmetric strategy game. Um, how fast do you think you could do it? Like." Do you feel? Do you feel? No, it, it was it was phrased as speed, with the knowledge that it would be like, um, that I you know it, to do it well, how quickly could you work? And you have to understand, you know, I've been designing for three years at that point, but I was one person plus like a group of friends who chit chat about games. I worked slowly, but now like he, he Patrick was like, look, the studio is at 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 your service as. You know, we we're, we will all be working on this. You can play test it four times a day if you need to play test it four times a day. And uh, it was funny, you know. I've I've often told my wife every year in graduate school, I'd say, okay, next year is the really busy year. Um, and it's just become a bit of a joke in our house that I'm going to say that. But I had to. I came home that day. I said, you know, this year is going to be really busy. But then, it might it might not be as busy anymore. And I I'm, I don't know if I'm being proven wrong in that, but. I went to work the next day at about 6.30 in the morning and worked every day 10, 11, 12 hours, just kind of starting from scratch and, and building it. And, you know, at that time, we had, we had, uh, we had kind of come to a parlay with, with the designer of Deep that um, he would take some more time and potentially another designer would come in and help him if they could get something to work out. Um, so I was – there was a really funny pressure on me, which is that um, – Deep, I thought was still going to happen. 
Uh, and so I didn't want to design anything that was anything like deep. I wanted to consciously stay like the farthest distance that I could from that game uh, because, you know, when you're working for a company, you want every game that company produces to be able to be purchased and sit on the same shelf. And also at this time, you know, you're actually an employee of Leader Games, whereas Sam was working contract, right? Yes, correct. Right, right. So, yeah, Sam was working a contract and he, um, I think he had, he had picked up work somewhere else um, for a company in Belgium, maybe. I can't remember the exact details of it. But it, it was interesting because, you know, I um, I think one of the most important things about design is to borrow and to, to look at what everybody else is doing and to figure out, like, okay, I need a little bit of Magic Realm. I want, like, a little bit of the coin game. I, and I try to... Uh, you know, whenever I'm writing, I do the same thing when I'm writing. Some people, if they're writing something, will not want to read other, you know, novels of the same subject. Uh, but coming from an academic background, the first stage of writing a paper is going to the library and checking out every single book you can find, even remotely on the subject. And so that's sort of how I treat game design. But for 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 Root, uh, which at that time was called Rule uh, before we called it Root, uh, Root is a much better name. Um, <laughs> we, uh, yeah. I, I really like, <laughs> um, I really tried to, to read widely and said, but you know what? I'm, I don't want to touch any of the spaces that were even like one degree or two degrees away from where Sam might take deep, uh, which, which was fine because they're like, it was such a different game. <laughs> um, like even in the, even in the most early step, it was like, this is its own weird. I mean, for one, um, I really love coin games. I love kind of where modern wargaming is, and I was pulling a lot of it. And in fact, it doesn't. Um, when I talk about the inspirations for Root, I spend a lot of time talking about the Vokos games and Andy and Abyss and things like that. Those influences, by the time the game was fully baked, you you'd be hard pressed to find too much coin in it. But at that stage, I was thinking of I was thinking through those games a lot because I felt like they. Um, they provided a useful template because they, you know, most war games are two-player affairs, and Vokos series, uh, they're, they're multilateral, and that was the direction I wanted to go. And so, every, I mean, we just worked and worked and worked and worked, and after about a month of just like every, I mean, it, it was it was ins- I've never done this before in my life, where I would like come home, put the like have dinner, put the kids to bed, and then go back to work. And after about a month, I played it for the studio. Uh, like I, I took it out, everybody came, we all played it, and at the end of the meeting, it was like, "This is, we can put this on Kickstarter right now. Like it's ready. It's ready. It's ready." And it, like it, I was surprised that I could work that quickly. But you know, when you have a staff of people who can just play the game, and at this point, um, the the expansions for Vast, uh, the Fearsome Foes, and the Miniatures expansion. They hadn't arrived yet. They weren't going to arrive until the winter. So, like, our operations team could play the game. Um, and so we were just, because the studio was so small, like, we were able to just fully, fully, fully pile in. Um, and uh, we we built the Kickstarter page, and it, it was it was done, like, I don't know, there was some kind of fire beneath all of us. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I think when we made that video, I, I wrote out the script for the video, and then um, we were running out of time, and so I, I just went. I went to my wife. I was like, "Can you read this script?" <laughs> and so she she just read read the script for the Kickstarter editor video because we didn't have time to like send it to an actor. Um, and you know, it was funny. Originally, I wasn't going to do the graphic design for the game, but it I was just it was easier for me to I could work more quickly if I just did it. So we, we didn't have to yeah, coordinate. totally. Um, and then you know, we ran the Kickstarter, and it just. I, it, it, it activated this audience. Like we, I mean, it really, people always say like, oh, you know, it, it was way beyond expectations. Like, like, no, this was way beyond expectations. Um, and there was this open question because, you know, with leader games, you have Patrick's audience and you have Kyle's audience and then you have my little audience. And when you mix audiences, sometimes people don't come along. Uh, and so you always kind of assume that the shared audience is going to be smaller than the sum of the individual groups, but that isn't what happened. What happened was my audience, like it was like this weird alchemy where like the people who were following my work were posting the design essays I was writing on Reddit, which were then getting tons of traffic 
from people that were like adjacent to Patrick's audience and then Patrick's audience, like, and a lot of them are like on Facebook and things like that. They're talking about it and then pulling people in and then Kyle, everyone's kind of bouncing through, through Kyle's, you know, sphere of music. Kyle is so good, has such great social media. Um, and, and like the result was something really much greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and then, you know, uh, at the end of the Kickstarter, we like there were just all these signs. I mean, it, it's one thing to see that funding total go up, but it's another thing that when the staff was at PAX Unplugged, there were just lines everywhere to, to wait to wait to play the game. So like, it was clear there was just something that was kind of being tapped on. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's I've I've had a lot of strange things happen to me in my life, but that is something totally else. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, I was at PAX Unplugged, and I, I, I already had my hands on the game. I, I loved the game. And so I was just kind of tracking what was going on with Root. And I remember going to uh, – it's a East Coast thing here. This is my Alaska ignorance coming out. I, I think it's like Shake Shack or, or there's some burger joint. And it's you know maybe five blocks, uh, somewhere between five to seven blocks from the convention center. After the convention, the day after the convention, I'm going to go get a burger with uh, the guys that I went down there with, um, Rob and Robert, and we're actually waiting to get our burger up, just watching a whole crowd of people gathered around a game of Root. Clearly, they just got it at the, 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 the convention, and they're just playing it at a restaurant, you know, a burger restaurant. And this is after the convention has already happened. I'm just like, there's something so special about this game. And the way that the people surrounding the game, not just the players, but other people were just entranced by it. And I, you're right. There is a weird alchemy to it. And, and I think what it is, is it, it taps into something that, that everyone can really latch on to. Yeah, I mean, it. I think... For me, this so design had even though I I rely a lot on this kind of like gr- these groups of playtesters and people like my brother who've kind of helped me with all the game projects I've worked on. Uh, design is ultimately like really solitary. At least it had been. And one of the things that Root brought into focus was the degree to which game design can be collaborative. And you know there are different roles to play. I mean, really, Patrick, you know, he provided that initial concept, and then he was also like, he was the creative director of that project. He was always kind of thinking about its general shape, um, which, I mean, it was just his. He would give little pieces of advice that were always really interesting uh, and, and useful. And with Kyle, um, you know, I had never collaborated with an artist before. And Kyle and I, I think, developed a real fr- a real friendship around around the game, and also just I could be really clear when I like w- w- Kyle and I would would meet about the art, and it was funny because of the pace that we were working at, we had a lot of like late night calls and late night chats just because we were like up working on this game, and we spent a lot of time talking about the world and kind of thinking in particular about the things about animal parables and about games that are made to be kind of accessible um, and where they kind of get that wrong. So we really wanted, you know, constantly we were like, this isn't My Little Pony. This is Wind of the Willows. And, or like, or it's, it's more like Disney's Robin Hood than it's like any number of like, sort of like cutesy for the sake of cutesy things. Uh, that are produced because it's, you know, this this is a trope to kind of like animalize all these different, uh, these different political positions. And one of the things that I, that I was really insistent about and that I think resonated with Kyle and then Kyle was able to do really wonderful things with, and then also kind of add to and push back is I was like, it's really important that we don't create like a weird racism to this fantasy world because that's one of my biggest problems with Redwall. I mean, I grew up with the Redwall books and I love them, but um, they are analogies that are not always comfortable. Like a person born a weasel is always a weasel, that kind of stuff. And so with Root, we wanted to create this like really broad uh, base for the, that, that basically what we wanted, I think that the better way to say it maybe is in terms of the design, I was trying to think as broadly and as um, as openly about 
who gets to participate in society and how that participation gets sort of scaffolded. And mm-hmm. when it came to the art, um, Kyle was on the exact same page and built this like really wonderful like world that was not. And I, I want to make sure this is absolutely clear. Like this world was in progress well before I came onto the scene. Like Kyle was uh, originally Patrick was working on this game called Path, which is a big open world adventure game that was going to be set in this animal world. And and we are still Patrick is still working on it. Um, and so, so the, the, this world had been like kind of sitting in the cooker for a long time, and uh, I just I'm, I was really lucky that like it made sense to apply that world. Like as soon as we started, you know, when Patrick he gave me the concept and I'm working on the game, and we were talking about it once, and I said, you know, the thing that I really want to do with this design is, I think there are a lot more people who would care about these kind of interactive, almost wargamey things. Uh, then realize it. But the problem is that like all the light war games out there are aimed at children or they are like World War II themed but like comic book style, like memoir. Um, mm-hmm. And I wonder if actually we can make like a pretty sharp, interesting critique but package it in such a way that isn't as gendered, that isn't trying to like communicate, you know, anything about like the seriousness of the game. Um, because cute things can be serious too. And Kyle's art was such a good fit for that because he has just tremendous range. I think people are going to be really, uh, I think surprised and delighted when they get the new copies of vast in the mail, uh, in the next few months, because even seeing him work on the art for that, uh, some of it is quite dark, but all is totally in keeping with the general mood. And I think this is one of Kyle's real strengths as an illustrator is he can create these really robust moods and then completely flesh them out with dozens and dozens and dozens of pieces that fit a part of that mood. Right, right. He he conveys so much personality in each and every thing that he touches, but it still feels at home within the, the world that he's depicting. And more than anything... He can make separate worlds. Like uh, that's one of the cool things is there. There's definitely a vibe to the the artwork that has you know similarities and vast and root, but you wouldn't confuse the two. Mm-hmm. You know, like they they feel like they're intentionally different, and the characters within root feel like they belong within root. But again, you know the 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 level of detail and personality that's conveyed in each and every critter that's drawn, or each and every character, even a skeleton. How do you imbue personality into a skeleton? Yet he manages to do that in vast. It's really incredible, and, and I I think a lot of that comes out of you know as a creative person myself, feeling at peak creativity often is you know, having the team to support you. And that, that really sounds like what all of you have found in one another, which is so cool about leader games. And, you know, I could talk to you like this went a completely different direction than I initially intended for this interview. Like I, I had questions about PAX Pamir laid out. I, I had lofty ideas about talking to you about, you know, getting your creative, uh, I guess, creative uh, pigeonhole in being the hyper asymmetric company that leader games is now known as. And do you embrace that? Do you work against it? You know, how do you innovate? I, I had all kinds of questions about tons of different stuff about your history. I feel like we barely got to talk about like you pre <laughs> pre board game publisher, board game designer, board game developer, but yet we still had a ton to talk about. So I would love it if you came back on the show sometime soon and we can hit on some of these other things. But for now, I'm just completely like over the moon about what we're going to get with Root the Underworld. Yeah, uh, I am. You know, I will, I will say, uh, by first of all, this is wonderful. I'm happy to, to come on anytime. But the, um, the one thing I will say about the company and the direction I see it going in is, you know, I think Patrick's original hook was definitely asymmetry, but asymmetry is never, it's always the the question of asymmetry is the question of to what end. And I think 
with Vast and the new Vast and with Root, the end is uh, it's about the interaction between the players. And I, you know, what I'll tell people sometimes is we want games where the interactions that we have with each other aren't mediated by the flip of an event card, but instead are extensions of a really expressive system. And so, you know, uh, the games that we're actually working on right now, some of them are not asymmetric really at all, but what they share in common is really sort of like naughty and dense interactions and really cool emergent storytelling. And I think this, this is the place that we want to kind of push things forward. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, for folks that, uh, that found root is a really wonderful site. Uh, you have so much to look forward to. I cannot stress it enough. Um, the expansion has been a complete pleasure to help develop in my small way. It is, um, you know, these things are a lot of work and certain games, even excellent games are hard to work on. Um, and the new root material has been so much fun. And we, you know, I think everyone at the company, <laughs> we didn't have the, me the mentality that we wanted to like run off and milk everybody for another go around and get them more content. Um, we were just having too much fun <laughs> playing this stuff in office. And when it, when it came time to set the schedule, it was so obvious that like, oh, of course we should share all this root stuff we've been doing with people. Everyone should go and check out the the Kickstarter for Root the Underworld, which should be up now if you're listening to this as it goes live. And of course, do yourself a favor and watch the extremely charismatic reviewer, Jack Eddy of the Cardboard Herald, uh, on the video channel uh, for a review of Root. I truly think that uh, it is one of my favorite games. I put it as one of my top 20 favorite games, and I, I think I justified how such a new game could could manage to, to entrance me so much. So this has been an absolute pleasure. Cole, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, it was my pleasure, Jack, uh, and I'd be happy to come back again. As always, the Cardboard Herald is a completely free service focused on spotlighting games, gamers, and game creators. You can find all of our podcasts, including the Cardboard Herald and TCBH reviews, on iTunes, Stitcher, and our website. For more recommendations and reviews, you can also head over to our YouTube channel. We do not pay to advertise the show, so please continue spreading the word, following, liking, rating, and doing all the social media things. It truly does help us out a ton. If you'd like to drop us a line and maybe have your listener mail read on air, find us on Twitter, at Cardboard herald or send us an email to cardboardherald at gmail.com or click the contact link on our page once again thank you for listening i've been jack for the cardboard herald and you keep on gaming <laughs>